بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا uh, where we've reached to in the chapters of fiqh pertaining to salah in the book written by the great Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi may Allah have mercy upon him we've reached to a very important chapter entitled Bab Sa'at Allati Nuhiya Ani Salah Fiha the section or the chapter that is pertaining to the timings wherein you cannot pray in those timings and they are five so there are five times when you cannot pray optional prayers non-obligatory prayers in those times but if you have forgotten obligatory prayers or you were in an emergency situation and you couldn't pray the obligatory prayers then you could pray the obligatory prayers in these forbidden times however specifically it's referring to the optional prayers so five times we're going to mention wherein you cannot pray any optional prayers and this is quite interesting because it alludes and it brings to mind um, a rule mentioned in fiqh which is that ibadah is tawqifiya worship is known as being tawqifiya tawqifiya meaning that you cannot do any act of worship unless it's legislated unless you have a proof from it from the quran and the sunnah Therefore, you can only move when the Qur'an and the Sunnah gives you the green light to move. And when it tells you to stop in terms of worship, you have to stop. So ibadah worship is tawqifiyah, meaning that you have to stop at the limits that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa From the evidences of this great principle, because one may think, okay, how can it be that such a revered act of worship in Islam like prayer why is it that I'm now being told that there's certain times in the day and the night that I can't pray? It comes down to this point that we're discussing now, that this principle, that ibadah is tawqifiyah, you can only do an act of worship when you have proof of its legislation. And when the legislator, Allah Azawajal, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi tell you that you cannot do an act of worship, then you step back and you stop. So we have in the hadith, which is narrated by Imam Tabarani in his Mu'jim al-Kabir, and it's authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani alayhi, where the great companion Abi Dhar radiyallahu anhu he said that the Prophet sallallahu said مَا بَقِيَ شَيْءٌ يُقَرِّبُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَيُبَعِدْ مِنَ النَّارِ إِلَّا وَقُدْ بُيِّنَ لَكُمْ that this great companion said that the Prophet sallallahu has stated that there is nothing left which can bring you close to Jannah or keep you away from the, away from the fire except the air that it has been clarified to you. There's nothing which will bring you close to Jannah or keep you away from the fire, except that I have clarified it to you. So this shows us that when we have these whims and desires that are whispered to us to shay by shaitan, which he does often, trying to misguide people in terms of beliefs that they should have or acts of worship that they should do, Shaitan comes to us and he makes us think that, you know, it's really good for you to do this act of worship. It's really good for you to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ. But we know that this was not legislated because the Prophet never did it, the companions never did it, the early Muslims never did it. So this is just a misguidance from Shaitan. The Shaitan and the whisperings will come to you that, hey, it's a great idea. Why don't I go to the grave of the righteous people? Why don't I sit there and make dua? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us clearly in the Qur'an that أَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَ That verily the masajid and the place up and places of worship belong to Allah alone. So only make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So making dua at the graves and to the people of the graves is something which is forbidden. So there's many times that shaitan comes to us and whispers to us that we should do such and such in terms of an act of worship to come close to Allah. Or we should hold such and such a belief. But this hadith that I just quoted to you shows clearly that there's nothing that can bring us closer to Jannah or keep us further away from the hellfire except that the Prophet ﷺ has already explained it to us. There's no need for us to invent anything or to think of anything. Otherwise we become like the other religions who lost their ways because they didn't follow textual evidences anymore. They changed things on purpose or they changed things due to their desires. Also with regards to this principle, we have another hadith which is very important and it alludes to this. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet She said that the Prophet said, said مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْنِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever brings about something new 
in this religion, in this affair of ours, that which is not from it, will have it rejected. So no matter how you think you are coming close to Allah if it's not legislated by Allah and brought to us by the Prophet and understood by the companions of the Prophet then we can't do the act of worship. So again, all those people who celebrate, for example, the birthday of the Prophet and try to resemble the Christians in the sense that they celebrate the birthday of Isa which is a lie, then they are doing something which is going to be rejected. Because the Prophet ﷺ and his companions never did it. Allah never guided us to do such an act. So it's extremely important that when we do acts of worship, we always, and when we have beliefs, Islamic beliefs, we always try our utmost to find out did the Prophet ﷺ teach this? Did the companions understand it the way we understand it? Did the early Muslim scholars, the great Muslim scholars, which are well known, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik and many others after them, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Tirmidhi, did these great personalities, mountains of knowledge, did they act upon this information? If not, then we shouldn't act upon it because it means it wasn't legislated in the early parts of Islam. So the hadith I just quoted to you, whoever brings about something new in this religion which was not from it will have it rejected, right? This is the hadith that I quoted. But then somebody may say, okay, I'm not bringing about this act of worship or this belief. I'm just following it. I found my forefathers upon it. I found people before me doing it. So it's not me that's introducing this new belief or this new act of worship. So therefore, I don't fall into the prohibition. Well, the same hadith has another narration which completes comprehensively the meaning. And the other narration is in Sahih Muslim of the same hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said Man amila amilan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. Whoever does an action which is not upon the actions that we are upon then it would be rejected. So in this hadith it doesn't mention that the one who brings something new. It mentioned that the one who acts in a way or does an act of worship that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were not upon then it will be rejected. So in both cases, in both ahadith, it comprehensively covers that whether you are somebody who's bringing about a new act of worship or a new belief, or you are somebody who's doing a new act of worship, then it's going to be rejected and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't accept it from you and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is free from that misguidance and from that innovation. So as believers, as worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are overjoyed in a way to understand that worship, ibadah, is tawqifiyya. That worship is restricted and it can only be done, you can only move through worship and beliefs with permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning that you, can, you have to have evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. So this brings us joy. Why? Because we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. And he owns everything in his, cre in his creation. And he has complete majesty over everything. So this is from the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That only he alone is able to legislate what his slaves should do in terms of worship and in terms of belief. And it gives us great joy to know this because we are lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anybody who tries to compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that majesty, we reject them and we tell them to be far away. Because this legislating of acts of worship belongs to only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also secondly we know that whatever Allah has legislated is full of justice it's full of wisdom it's full of benefit it's full of what we need to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's full of what we need to have a fruitful and happy life in this world and anybody from amongst the creation will never be able to bring guidance like the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when men come to us or women come to us with their fanciful ideas trying to bring about new beliefs or new acts of worship, we know that they don't have the right to do so and they are spoiling the religion of Islam by doing so. So we reject it. And all of this, what I'm talking about, is related to that principle, al-ibadah tawqifiyah, that worship is tawqifiyah, worship is restricted. And you can only move about in the worship with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this relating to the chapter of times where it's prohibited to pray nawafil salawat, to pray. Because one may think, why am I prohibited from praying, which is something which is a good deed, but based upon the explanation I just gave you, it's fully understandable as to why. 
طيب, the author may Allah have mercy upon him he mentions that the first time we're in it's forbidden to pray بعد الفجر حتى تطلع الشمس حتى تطلع الشمس that from the time when Fajr comes in the time of Fajr has come in until sunrise in this time there's no optional prayers that are allowed with the exception of the Sunnah of Fajr the Sunnah of Fajr can be done of course once the time of Fajr has come in and before you pray the obligatory Fard prayer of Fajr you can do the Sunnah of prayer however if you miss the Sunnah of Fajr and you want to do it after the obligatory prayer then you cannot do it until the sun has risen why because we said that from the time of Fajr coming in until sunrise all of this time is a forbidden time of praying uh, optional prayers except for the Sunnah of Fajr when it's done before the obligatory Fajr if you need to do it after the obligatory Fajr because you forgot to do the Sunnah or something kept you away from it then the only time you can do it after the obligatory prayer of Fajr is once the sun has risen طيب, so that's the first time and the evidence for this we find it in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu who said that the Prophet وسلم, said لا صلاة بعد الأصر حتى تغرب الشمس ولا صلاة بعد الفجر حتى تطلع الشمس that there's no prayer after the Asr prayer until the sun has set and there's no prayer after the Fajr prayer until the sun has risen this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim so that's the first time from the time that Fajr comes in until sunrise there is no optional prayers except for the two units the two Sunnah which is to be done before the obligatory prayer of Fajr then the author says وَبَعْدَ طُلُوعِهَا حَتَّى تَرْتَفِعَ قِيدَ الرُّمْحَ and after the sun has risen after the sun has risen um, or after the sunrise until the sun rises further the length of a spear so if you were to put a spear in the, ha- uh, in the horizon if you were to put a spear on the ground and you were to look at the horizon once the, the sun has risen above that length of the spear then you can go ahead and pray now the optional prayers Shaykh Uthaymeen, may Allah have mercy upon him and other scholars, they have said that this is roughly around 5 to 10 minutes after sunrise. So once the sun has risen, you wait around 5 to 10 minutes uh, or 15 to be safe and then you go ahead and you can pray any optional prayers that you wish to do so. That's when you could do the sunnah of uh, Fajr if you missed it. That's when you can do Salat al-Duha for example if you missed it and anything else that may be legislated. Uh, so once, sun, once the sun has risen until it goes further the height of a spear so we said that from the time of sunrise around 10 to 15 minutes okay وَإِنْدَ قِيَامِهَا حَتَّى تَزُولُ and now the third time when you cannot pray optional prayers or you cannot even pray the um, obligatory prayers is when the sun has reached the meridian of the sky the zenith of the sky okay and it stops there in the middle of the sky and it will stay there for around five minutes or maybe less than that so the scholars they say at this time which is the time before dhuhr remember the time of dhuhr starts once the sun is in the middle of the sky in the zenith and then it moves on uh, towards the sunset okay just moves even a little bit that's when the time of dhuhr starts but at the point where the sun is in the middle of the sky and it stops for those few minutes this is a time which is forbidden for you to pray in and again some of the scholars they said it's five minutes others say it's 15 minutes to be safe and Allah knows best but the point being once the sun is at the meridian at the zenith at that point we cannot pray so it's a very short time before Salat al-Dhuhr another time the fourth time is بَعْدَ الْعَصْرِ حَتَّى تَتَدَيَّفَ الشَّمْسِ لِلْغُرُوبِ after Salat al-Asr has been prayed until the sun becomes weakened and it's ready to start setting okay once Salat al-Asr has been prayed and the rays of the sun they become weakened until the sun then sets so this time um, it's forbidden for you to pray again we said after you've prayed Salat al-Asr you cannot pray any other prayer until the sun sets but here what they're mentioning is from when after Asr when the sun becomes weak 
and it's going to start to set. And then added to this, a fifth time is mentioned by the author. He said, تغرب, And from the time the sun becomes weak until it actually sets. Okay? There are reasons why the author has given these extra, extra information, which I'll explain in a moment, hopefully. So anyway, from the time of after praying Asr, when the sun becomes weakened until it sets, is around 15 to 20 minutes, uh, roughly, I believe. So in this time, after having prayed Salat al-Asr, you are not allowed to pray any other prayer until the sun has set. So these are the five times, and you can sum them up in three times in essence. You can sum them up in the first time being from the time that Fajr time has come in until the sun has risen a spare's length above the horizon. Okay, that's the first time. So that's from the time of Fajr until 10 minutes after sunrise, we can say, or to the spare's length, uh, the sun has risen. That's the first time. The second time, is the time when the sun is in the middle of the sky until it moves. Okay, that five minutes or so, or maybe even less than that. That's the second time. The third time that we can sum up is from the time that you have prayed Salat al-Asr until sunset, then there's no prayer for you allowed. So these are three simplistic ways of summing up the times when you cannot pray. Okay? Uh, the author he moves on for هذه ساعات لا يصلي فيها تطوعا. So these times that we have mentioned the five and I summarize them as three, you cannot pray in them any optional prayer. Okay, you cannot pray in them any optional prayer. طيب. The author he said إلا إعادة الجماعة إذا أقيمت وهو في المسجد. Except for the person, the man, that has to respond to the obligatory prayer in the masjid. So if a person lives close to the masjid, wherein that they can hear the adhan, for the male, for the, for the male, it's obligatory to respond to that call and they have to go and pray in the masjid. So the author is saying, if you happen to be in the masjid and you've prayed already, okay, but then you happen to go to the masjid, and there is, he said, And an exception from the times, uh, from um, being allowed to pray in the forbidden times, is that if you are in the masjid, and it means that you are going to repeat your prayer because the congregation of the masjid has now been established. The iqamah has taken place. So it could be that you've prayed at home, okay, if, if the person is a male. And then for whatever reason, they went to the masjid. And now in the masjid, the actual congregation that is supposed to take in the masjid has stood and they are ready to pray. If that's the case, then it's highly recommended and the person should get up and also pray with them in that congregation, even though they've already prayed. So the person may have prayed Asr at home and he knows that after praying Asr, he's not allowed to pray again. Except in this situation, okay, where the jama'ah is about to be established. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said to two men that he saw sitting uh, behind the congregation and not praying with them. He said in the hadith in Tirmidhi and Abi Da'ud, ma ma an ma'ana. What prevented you from praying with us? Qala, they both said, Ya Rasulullah, qad kunna salayna fi rihalina. O oh, Messenger of Allah, we prayed in our uh, dwelling places. Qala fala taf'ala. He said, the Prophet said, don't do so. Ida salaytuma fi rihalikuma thumma ataytuma masjid jama'atin fa salya ma'ahum if you have prayed in your dwelling places and then you come to the masjid and the congregation is ready to pray, then don't just sit back, rather pray with them. So this is an exception from the, uh, from the optional prayers because for the one who prays with the congregation in the situation we're describing, his prayer is going to be an optional prayer. So this is an exception for the ones uh, in the forbidden times that they can pray again an optional prayer. It's an exception. Another exception from these uh, forbidden times for an optional prayer is tawaf ba'dahu. Is that when you are in Umrah al-Hajj, you make tawaf, you've done your tawaf. If you're uh, now in a forbidden time, from the times that we've mentioned, you are allowed to do the two recommended units of prayer after you have completed the tawaf, the circumambulation of the Kaaba. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith and writing by Imam Ahmad and others, 
يا بني عبد المناف او tribe of عبد المناف لا تملوا احدا طاف بهذا البيت وصلى اي ساعة شاء من ليل او نهار او tribe of عبد بني عبد المناف do not prevent anybody who has made tawaf around this house meaning the Kaaba and wishes to pray at any time of the day or night that they wish to do so so the hadith is alluding to the fact that once you've made tawaf at any time of the day or the night you can go ahead and pray even in the forbidden times and this is alluding to the two units that you pray after the tawaf the author he says may Allah have mercy upon him was salat ala janaza and also an exception from the forbidden times is that you can pray upon the janaza you can pray the funeral prayer okay you can do the funeral prayer and this is pertaining to not all of the times okay so we said that this five times and if you, if you remember the way it was broken down out of those five times three of them were very short the first obvious short one was when the sun is in the meridian okay and it stays there before it moves on towards the place of setting uh, towards the uh, west by a few moments right so that's a very short time another short time was once the sun has risen and then we said it has to rise further to the length of a spear and that again was around five to ten minutes and some said 15. the third short time was from the time when the sun becomes weak after asr and it goes then to set and we said that time is around 15 minutes so these three short times the author is not talking about these okay he's talking about the long times the longer times and the longer time is from the time when Fajr comes in until sunrise that's one long time the second long time is from the time of Asr coming in okay until Asr has been pr been prayed whenever that be these are the two long times wherein it's possible for you to pray the Salat al Janazah after having prayed the Fajr or after having prayed the Asr Okay, because we said after praying Fajr, no prayer can be after that. After praying Asr, no prayer can be after that. But in these long times that we mentioned, it's allowed to pray the Janazah prayer, the burial prayer. The reason you're not allowed to pray in those short times because it's easy for a person to wait. It's easy for the community to wait because only, it's only five to ten minutes according to some scholars and according to others, fifteen. So it's not a very long time at all. You can wait and then you can bury and pray uh, the Janazah, the burial prayer thereafter. The author he says, And also an exception is that you can make up the Sunan al Rawatib. Remember the Sunan al Rawatib that we took in the previous lesson? Those 10 units of prayer which are connected to the obligatory prayers two before Fajr, two before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, and two after Isha. Mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Umar where he said, Hafidtu min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam ashra rak'at. I memorized from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam 10 rak'at, right? So we discussed this last week. The author is saying that these sunnan al rawatib, you can make these up if you miss them, fi waqtain minha, in the in two times from these forbidden times. Wa huma ba'd al fajr, and this is after fajr, after having prayed fajr once the sun has risen, okay? Wa ba'd al asr, and after asr salah. And after the Asr Salah. Tayyib, the author, he says, وَيَجُوزُ قَضَاءَ الْمَفْرُوضَاتِ فِي جَمِيعَ الْأَوْقَاتِ And it's permissible for you to make up all of the obligatory prayers in any time given, whether it's a forbidden time or not a forbidden time, for you to make qada of the missed prayers, the missed obligatory prayers. And when we say this word qada, making up missed prayers, a lot of people misuse this and they they kind of you know okay i'm having a difficult day it's a bit busy at work i'm going to leave off all of the prayers i'm going to pray them together when i get home this is not allowed it's only allowed in real times of difficulty say for example some, somebody's a doctor and they are operating on somebody if they were to leave the patient to go ahead and pray then this would cause the patient great harm and by the time they finish the operation the time for prayer has missed so in this situation, the person is allowed to do qada, to make up the obligatory prayer, because they have a real excuse. But for somebody who's just finding slight difficulty, is unable to organize their day properly, okay, in this situation, they're not allowed to make up the day. In fact, if you're at work and you're a practicing Muslim, you should develop that relationship with your team 
and with your management to say to them, look, if it needs be that I have to do half an hour extra work, then fine, I'll do that happily. But you have to give me time to go and pray. And it's only going to take you five minutes if, if you need to pray within five minutes only. If you've got more time, you pray more time. But if it's the case that you only have five minutes to pray, then you go ahead and pray those five minutes and you bargain and you negotiate with the places of work to allow you to pray. Anyway, the author is saying that it's permissible for you to make up the obligatory prayers in any of these times that we have discussed. Why? Because in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man salah aw nama anha fa kafaratuha an yusalliha idha dhakraha la kafarata laha illa dhalik. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever forgets a prayer, whoever forgets to pray an obligatory prayer, or oversleeps, not intentionally, oversleeps that prayer, then the expiation of that act of missing the prayer is to pray it as soon as you remember. As soon as you remember that you've missed the prayer or as soon as you get up from your oversleeping, then you have to straight away pray the prayer that you missed even if you end up being in a forbidden time. Okay? But as we said, that the qada is not to be misused. This qada, the meaning of making up the prayers, is only for those who have an excuse to do so. Um, also an exception that we need to mention for the, um, for the forbidden times is on the day of Jummah, sometimes the khutbah takes place at that time when the sun is in the meridian. Okay? At that forbidden time, when the sun is in the middle of the sky. If a person enters the masjid and they want to pray what is known as Tahiyatul Masjid, two rakahs before you sit down once you enter the masjid, if the Imam is in that forbidden time and he's giving the khutbah, it's allowed for the Imam to do that, but it's not allowed for anyone to pray. This here is an exception that the ulama they also give. Why? Because there's evidence that the Prophet ﷺ told somebody that you have to make that prayer in this time. So also an exception from the forbidden times is that if the Imam is giving the khutbah and it happens to coincide with that time, of the meridian, the zenith, when the sun is in the zenith, in the middle of the sky, and the imam is giving the khutbah, then at this time, it's permissible for the person to pray those two units of prayer known as tahiyatul masjid, which is the two units of prayer you pray when you come to the masjid before sitting down in the masjid. I'm going to stop here today, and I'm unable to make it longer than this today. I apologize for the brevity of the lesson. But if you have any questions and answers, we can deal with those now. And anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan.